solidarity with African people. I am the chair of the African People's Solidarity Committee, and we welcome you. This is a profound event. I really want to appreciate Life Malcolm's <laughs> statement and want to call for unity with support for his struggle, one of many that this movement is, is involved in. And I want to salute Jesse and the Uhuru Solidarity Movement, Jamie, Kafira, Johan, all the people who have been out, the comrades who have been out there building this and doing this incredible work out, out in the streets of St. Petersburg and this area and talking to other white people to bring them here tonight. And I, I think they have done a tremendous job. I want to also salute Chairman O'Malley Ishitella and to say that it has been an incredible honor to have worked under his leadership for 38 years, 38 years this month. That is when uh, the African People's Solidarity Committee was formed in 1976. And the first time that I heard the chairman speak was in Louisville, Kentucky. And when I heard him speak, and, and I knew nothing, I was, not a, I was not really a political person in any way, but when I heard the chairman lay out the world as, as it really is, I knew, I knew that this was correct. This was the reality that was there, and it was, it was a, a, a profound honor to, to join when the chairman said we were building the African People's Solidarity Committee and, and called on, on me and others, and, and I came down to St. Petersburg, Florida, here in, in, in that year, and, and joined, and I've been part of it ever since, because how can, we, how can we see the world and begin to understand it through the eyes of the African community and then just walk away from that? And especially when we look at the world as it is now, when we see Michael Brown shot down in the street, his body left for four hours, bleeding out there as a, as a colonial terror against the African community. We see every single day a story just like that, either in the media or mostly not, mostly not, often coming here. Uh, family members come here to talk about and, and share and, and organize around the conditions that, that African people face in this country. And, and that this leadership of, of Chairman Omalia Shetela has been incredible to see his courage and to, to see the, the movement from the 1970s to now where it is all over the world. The chairman can just as well be speaking in Ferguson, Missouri, where he was uh, a week or so ago, or in Paris, France, or Germany, or, or Africa, Johannesburg, or Sierra Leone, or, or any place else in the world about this struggle of African people and the unity of African people everywhere. And the African People's Solidarity Committee is the organization of white people of the African People's Socialist Party. It is the party organization. Our assignment is to go into the white community to bring black power to the heart of white power, to, to bring the eyes, the point of view of the African working class into the heart of imperialism and the system built on slavery and oppression. And we understand that black power is the power of liberation. It is the power of no oppression. It has not been built at the expense of everybody else. It is a struggle for all human beings to be free and liberated, for African people to be united all around the world and to, to have Africa as their own land, which it belongs to them. They talk about the Ebola crisis right now. The crisis is colonialism is the US sending military troops while Cuba sends doctors that Africans it, you know, have the most incredible diamonds in the whole world, gold, every mineral, oil, everything that you can think of, but they have no access to it. It is still colonialism, it is still Europe, US, and corporate powers that are extracting the wealth from there while the people are living on dollar a day and dying of Ebola not in the United States, but there. And so black power is in our interest as white people. It's what we have to be about. I hate white power. I think you do too. That's why you're here tonight. You're here because you want to end this system that we see all around us, this reality that black power is a completely different way of seeing the world. 
It is a different structure of the world. It is a different relationship of the economy and everything else in which all human beings can flourish and everyone has their needs met. And, I mean, just think of the world in that way. And that is what, what we are fighting for. And I believe that you are in the right place, that any white person has an interest in seeing this system come down. This system has to go. Imperialism and parasitic capitalism have to go. And African people and all oppressed peoples on the planet Earth have a right to their freedom, their liberation, their resources, their, their creativity, and the value of their labor. And this is the future that we want to see. We need revolution. Imperialism has to go. <laughs> but, you know, we look out and we, we read the news and, you know, we can see what's happening and we, we see what the chairman has called the crisis of imperialism. In fact, the chairman has this amazing book called the Une An Uneasy Equilibrium. The African Revolution versus Parasitic Capitalism. An uneasy equilibrium. And equilibrium is a balance. But yet, you know, the balance between imperialist power and the resistance of the people of the world struggling to be free. And right at this moment in history, this is, this is a very uneasy equilibrium that the chairman is saying. The balance is tipping on the side of oppressed and colonized people. So the future is good, not if you're seeing the world through the eyes of the imperialists, but if you see the world through the eyes of everybody that's resisting and standing up against this bloody system, this is an incredible period to live in. And this is what the chairman is talking to us about. And I believe that all of us have to be part of changing this world. We can't, we can't leave this for another generation. Look around you. The endless war, 13 years, the U.S. and Afghanistan, and deeper poverty, deeper oppression every single day. The U.S. and Iraq bombing Syria, bombing, you know, we see the struggle in occupied Palestine. We see every place around the world that the U.S. is out openly and also covertly, also underneath and, and hidden in every place, whether the U.S. Is, is forcing sanctions and starving people or bringing guns and drones and bombing the people day by day. And we have to understand, you know, we see the economy. The U.S. economy is not getting better. Every day Obama is saying, oh, it's the light at the end of the tunnel. Where? You know, people are, are working three jobs if they can get a job at all. People are losing their houses. They have no work. The economy is getting worse and worse every day, and it's not going to get better. And whatever it is that, you know, a lot of us expected the younger generation was going to be able to do, they're not going to be able to do that because the world is a different place than, than it ever was. And we have to be able to, to understand the world as it really is. And I know that the chairman has created and built a political understanding or a theory called African internationalism. That is something that we can all embrace. We can begin to, to see the world as the chairman is explaining it. And that's a little bit of what we're going to talk about right now. I know a lot of people in this room are here because you see the conditions faced by Africans every day. You see the reality that there's a Michael Brown shot down every day. In fact, the statistic that we've read is that since August 9th, when Michael Brown was shot, 187 more Africans have been killed. That's more than two a day by police, by white police, actually, in, in this country. And so a lot of people here might be saying, well, we have to fight racism. And I'm sure, you know, that's the thing that we've been taught, and that's the thing that many of us understand. But the fact is, Chairman Omalia Shatella has told us that the struggle against racism is a self-defeating waste of time. So what does that mean? Well, it means that the problem, as the chairman has said, is not racism, it's colonialism. It's colonialism. When you see it in Afghanistan, you don't call it racism, you call it colonialism. When you see it, in occupied Palestine, you don't call it racism, you call it colonialism. 
And I think that Life Malcolm's presentation is one example of that. White people take care of their dogs and it's considered a heroic thing. An African faces seven years in prison. You know, in the same circumstances, there's a universality to colonialism. It exists all over the world. And when we look at it in Afghanistan, when we look at it in any place in Africa, when we look at it in occupied Palestine, and we look at it in Ferguson or St. Petersburg or Tampa, it's the same entity. It's the same organism. So talk about racism versus colonialism. There's a, a Aimé César, who was an anti-colonial leader from, um, from Martinique, and he was a mentor, Frantz Fanon, who, was, who wrote amazing books like The Wretched of the Earth, and I really, really recommend that you read them. And he wrote a book called Colonialism, and he, called, he said colonialism for the colonized is thingification, turned into a thing nothing, no humanity, no robbed, you know, of the people. So colonialism is a concrete economic and political situation. Racism is an idea in our heads. And like all ideas in our heads, racism has a material basis. We understand things and we articulate things based on a reality. And that material basis is colonialism. Colonialism, a definition, would be the assault and occupation by one nation or people against another entire nation of people for profit, benefiting the entire oppressor, oppressor nation. It is forced extraction by violence. It is the fuel that makes capitalism and imperialism run. Colonialism is here that we can you know, pay a speaker on racism $7,000, and that's what a lot of them charge. Uh, and we can feel really good after he goes through his whole thing about how do we unlearn our racism. But we still go home to the white community and Africans still face being shot down by the police every single day in this country. And unlearning racism might make us feel good, but it doesn't change the conditions faced by Africans here or any place else in the world. Racism just deals with the symptoms. What will change this and is changing this is the leadership of the African Liberation Movement, the African People's Socialist Party that is struggling against colonialism, against US imperialism, and for the national liberation of African people as one people around the world. And this is really helpful for us to see that because it takes us out of the center of it, doesn't it? It's not about whether we unlearned our racism, so what? Who cares? The fact is, take a stand. Get organized under the leadership of the African working class and go back into the white community to organize other people just like ourselves and do more than change our thoughts, return the stolen resources to African people. Reparations, reparations, that's the best antidote to racism that we could possibly ever find. So there's a universality to colonialism, and it's here inside the United States. Because we look at the statistics in this country that has 2.3 million people in prison. I mean, you know, and I, I give this statistic all the time, but I can still hear that and shudder. Because China, which has a population of 1 billion people, has 1.5 million people in prison. This country with 300 million people has 2.3 million people in prison, two thirds of whom are African and Mexican. This, you know, how they talked about in the Soviet Union, there was the gulag, the political prisons. This is the gulag right here, who's in those prisons are African people and Mexican people. Going to, going to jail for things that white people don't even get arrested for. White people call daddy who brings the lawyer if there's something that happens. Africans go to prison over and over and over again, in and out of that prison system that is based on colonialism, based on slavery, and based on genocide. 
We live in a country where 61,000 children are in prison. Most countries in the entire world do not have children's prisons. When you want to talk about the who's the terrorist and the number of children in prison who are sexually and, and you know abused and and perpetrated against with with violence in every possible way is astounding. 58% of children in prison are Africans. 500,000 children go through the, the so-called juvenile system every year. That's a crime against humanity. Yes. That we live in a country where 700,000 Mostly African and Spanish speaking people were stopped and frisked in New York City in, in 2011 alone. 90% were African and Spanish speaking. Every, you know, this is, this is just an example of the conditions that, that exist. There's a Ferguson every day in this country. You see it on YouTube. You, you, see it, you see it more and more on Facebook. You see what the conditions are, how the police are in the African community, not in the white community. White community helping bring cats down from the trees or old, helping old ladies across the street. In the African community, terrorist forces that exist there. We see in the white community, we don't expect that our child would go to be walking down the middle of the street and get shot 17 times and, and lay in the sun for four hours bleeding out, or we don't expect them as, as in a case here in St. Petersburg where a 17 or 18 year old was at a graduation party shot by the police. But this is the reality. And the fact is that white families have 22 times the assets or wealth of African people. In this country, the African poverty rate is 28% versus 11% for white people. 10% of white children live in poverty, 33% of African children. And the police force is clearly an occupying force in the African community versus the white community. So no amount of unlearning racism is gonna change these conditions of colonialism. And to say that when we say it's for profit, that this system, this prison system is a multi-billion dollar economy. I read a statistic that the US puts about $60,000 a year into the system for each prisoner that it, it arrests, that it, that it holds in prison. And well, you know, and there's, there's people who say, well, look how much money we're losing on that. No, that's the stimulus. That's the economic stimulus that creates all the jobs that flow around the prison system in this country benefiting the white population and have been for the last 30 years. So we're talking about something very profound. We're talking about a struggle for national liberation inside the borders of the United States. The chairman's theory, African internationalism, says that capitalism is a parasite. It says that it's a tapeworm, it's a bloodsucker. It was born that way. There was, no, there was no benign capitalism. There wasn't a time when it was okay and it was good. It started by leaving the shores of Europe during a time when Europe was in feudalism and the majority of white people were serfs tied to the land, when everybody was poor, nobody had money, went out and Europe rescued itself by assaulting Africa, stealing its wealth and turning African human beings into the first commodities of the system called capitalism. And in this process, it slaughtered hundreds of millions of indigenous people. It colonized and, and, and destroyed the cultures and civilizations of Africa with violence. And it went out into the entire world, the Arab population, the Middle East, Asia, every place in the world, no place was untouched by this assault that Europe made. And as the chairman says, what is positive for us is hell for everybody else. And I, I want to read this little segment of this book because of the chairman's an uneasy equilibrium. And the chairman says, he says, unlike Marx and Lenin, we African internationalists deny that there's ever been anything progressive about capitalism. This is a really important point because he's taking on the fact that even Marx 
considered capitalism progressive, that it was better, it cured disease, it brought technology, it brought, you know, factories and all this kind of thing, and it's supposedly a higher standard of living. But the chairman says, capitalism was born in disrepute. It was born of the rapes, massacres, occupations, genocides, colonialism, and every despicable act humans are capable of inflicting. Capitalism was not responsible for some great, otherwise unimaginable leap in production, which despite its contradictions resulted in human progress and enlightenment. What capitalism did was to rip the vast majority of humanity out of the productive process in Africa, Asia, the Middle East, Australia, and what has come to be known as the Americas. The hundreds of millions dead due to the slave trade and slavery itself. The millions exterminated everywhere Europeans ventured. These are the people whose hands were forever removed from a relationship with nature that would result in production. Europeans achieved their national identity by way of this bloody process. Did you hear that? Europeans achieved our national identity through this bloody process. This is how we got to be white and the identity of white and Americans and Europeans. This is not something that only happened a long time ago. The world's peoples are suffering the consequences of capitalism's emergence even now. And when we look below the surface of any struggle in the entire world, its root is in the origins and bloody birth of parasitic capitalism. This took, in order to basically enslave and colonize African people and indigenous people in the entire world took violence that was unprecedented. We have a book that we produced from the African People's Solidarity Committee called Overturning the Culture of Violence. And it gives a lot of history of this violence that most of the world had never even imagined could exist, that you would do this. And, and you know how they turned it on the end. It, it wasn't indigenous people that scalped. It was white people, by the way, that did the scalping. You know, it wasn't white people. You know, it wasn't indigenous. It wasn't Africans that did these various things. It was white people. Everything that the US and Europe accused other people's of doing is what white people, what Europe has brought and visited onto the world. And when we look at this history, and we see that everything, everything that, that we take for granted in the white community and see the humor, the terror, the fact that white people engaged in lynchings, a festival of violence, that was actually a public spectacle. It wasn't something done in the night. It was where grandmothers came and children came. And look at the pictures online of, of little white kids all dressed up in fancy pinafores and little bows in their hairs, taking, with a, taking a picture, having their picture taken in front of the body of an African hung from a tree, hanged from a tree. That this violence, cutting babies out of African women's vaginas or wombs and cutting out the vaginas of, of indigenous women and turning and turning them into hat bands and other kinds of trophies. This is this is what Europe did and does. So you know when the US talks about somebody beheading somebody somewhere, this is what Europe does. This is what Europe has brought to the entire world, to humanity. This is what we have to have to take responsibility for. And the origins of capitalism and what it takes to maintain capitalism. This is, this is this question. This is under the surface of every resistance that is bubbling up any place in the world. This is also, I want to recommend this book. It's called The Half Has Never Been Told, Slavery in the Making of American Capitalism. It is a very profound book. It is, it reminds me in a lot of ways of overturning the culture of violence. This is just written by a professor. This is not a political activist or anything else. But what he is, it's a very, it's a very emotional book. It is not just statistics. He's telling the stories of Africans. He read, I think it was 2,500 narratives of Africans who had been enslaved. 
And he intertwines that with what their experiences are with the data that he has. And he's taking on a, a really serious, interesting, important premise. And that is that he's saying that most people in the United States, and certainly liberals, said this during the time of, of slavery and enslavement, and now, that in fact, the system of slavery would be more profitable if Africans had been paid because people would work harder to make their money. But he's saying, that's not true. That is not true. He's saying what happened was that the period of enslavement, and he's just dealing with the United States, and we have to remember this was going on all throughout the Caribbean, all throughout Brazil, Panama, you know, all other kinds of places all over this hemisphere, but he's saying inside the United States that more wealth was created through the greatest productivity ever imagined in humanity ever through the forced labor of African people enslaved in this country. And what did it take to do that? It took a violence that is unimaginable. And he's really, he's really powerful, and I think it's an important book because it represents the ideas of Chairman Omali Chatella permeating into academia and other places where people are having to deal with this. But I wanted to read, I just wanted to read something, a couple of things from this, and because I think it is, it is very, it is very deep. He says, um, he says, enslave people's creativity enabled their survival, but stolen from them in the form of ever-growing cotton productivity, their, creat their creativity also expanded the slaveholding South at an unprecedented rate. Enslaved Africans built the modern United States and indeed the entire modern world in both ways obvious and hidden. This is what Chairman O'Malley Chatello says. And he says, he talks about what Africans go through. Did anybody read, I know some people probably saw the book 12 Years a Slave, saw the movie 12 Years a Slave, but did anybody read the book? Because you must read that book. That is, that is a, a, a narrative by an African, Nor, uh, Solomon, Solomon Northrup, who, was, who had his, quote, freedom in New York, but he was captured by, um, you know, slave dealers, and he was sent, and he was forced into enslavement for 12 years, and he, he was able to get out, but he, he wrote a book about it and, and went around and lectured on this book, you know, during that period. And the, one of the things that, that the book 12 Years a Slave shows is, is that when we think of, you know, cotton and picking cotton and Africans picking cotton, is, is that African people who picked cotton were beaten brutally every single day, every single day. In fact, the more you picked, the higher your quota. And if you didn't make your quota, you were beaten. And if you made your quota, you might be beaten. They were beaten every single day, every single night. They, I mean, you know, women and men had scars that were so deep on their backs. They were inches, you know, in deep, and this is, the re this is what it took to make cotton, and cotton was the oil of today. It was the product, the commodity that was for sale, that was the basis of the world economy, and the real, the real actual commodity was African people themselves, but the item for sale, the product that was in use and worth incredible value all over the world was cotton. And so what the author, Edward Baptist, is saying is that when we talk about the enslavement of African people, we have to use the word torture. It was torture. It was sadism beyond anything that we can imagine. And he says, for many whites, Whipping was a gateway form of violence that led to bizarrely creative levels of sadism. In the sources that document the expansion of cotton production, 
you can find at one point or another almost every product sold in New Orleans st stores converted into an instrument of torture. Carpenter's tools, chains, cotton presses, hackles, handsaws, hoe handles, irons for branding livestock, nails, pokers, smoothing irons, single trees, steel yards, tongs. And he says, every modern method of torture was used at one time or another. Sexual humiliation and actually sexual violence. And that is shown in 12 Years a Slave also, by the way, in a very clear way. Sexual violence was a real part of the terror against African women and men. It was colonial violence. Mutilation, electric shocks, solitary confinement in stress positions tied by their hands hanging from the ceiling or other way. He says burning, even waterboarding was used against Africans and descriptions of runaways posted by enslavers were festooned with descriptions of scars, burns, mutilations, brands, and wounds. This is what it took, this is what it took to build the white America that we take for granted, even if we're not rich, even if, yeah. even if we don't, you know, we're not the Rockefellers, we're not, you know, the Gates, Bill Gates and all that, and we know that. But everything that we have came from this terror, and this is about what the U.S. did here. We're not even talking about what it did to the Filipino people, how many hundreds of thousands or millions of Filipinos they slaughtered and terrorized, or what was done to the indigenous people and the participation of the white population in that, or what was done any place else in the world in the name of Europe and North America and, and capitalism and white society. And actually, Baptist says in his book, he says, white people inflicted torture far more often than in almost any human society that ever existed. That's good old America. When people want to, that's apple pie. <laughs> That's uh, Thomas Jefferson, <laughs> you know, who was a slave owner, who raped his, his slave, Sally Hemings, and owned 300 Africans that he didn't set free when he died, and who, was, who had children, by the way, who had African children that he sold and forced at a very young age to work in his freaking nail factory, you know, as babies, as toddlers. This was the great... Thomas Jefferson that we're told to emulate as the great thinker of progressive America and thought. And I once read that recently that that terror visited on a people stays within the DNA of that people. It is there and I think that's that's very clear. That's very clear the African population. And I also wonder about Inflicting terror, does that stay in the DNA of a people? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. You know, there was just a trial of this, this white soldier that was in Afghanistan and he raped a 12 year old and killed the whole family and shot them down. He said, I didn't think of her as a human being, I didn't think of them as human beings. And that, you know, this is not an anomaly. This is capitalism. This is capitalism. This is what it is and it has to go. And, and, that you know, we live in a society that violence is our entertainment. <laughs> it's the movies, it's the TV. It's there, it's there to reinforce. Has there, has there been another society? I know Rome had violence, but besides white society that had violence as its entertainment? I have not read of that. So we're talking about what the chairman's telling us is a dialectic. And that means for one thing to exist, another, has to has to be there as well the opposite and capitalism is one system for us it might be amazing but for everybody else on this planet it's unmitigated hell and they have every instant every interest in tearing this system down brick by brick and that we live in a world in which the oppressed have been vilified have been criminalized because of the defeat of the African Revolution and the world revolutions of the 1960s. A counterinsurgency was waged against them. In this country, 
Martin Luther King, Malcolm X were brutally murdered. In Africa, Patrice Lumumba was brutally assassinated and his body chopped up to wipe out the consciousness from the minds of the people of their right, their birthright, to liberate Africa and liberate themselves. And so today, everything that we see around the world, this, this resistance, is the resistance of the oppressed fighting against this imperialism, fighting to overturn the system and bring about freedom and liberation. There was no word for genocide when, when Africans in the Congo under the Belgians were slaughtered 12 million strong. There was no word for genocide when the Philippines under the US were killed by the millions. <laughs> Indigenous people of this hemisphere slaughtered. There was no word for genocide. What has happened is the Holocaust already happened. It already happened. And white people all around the world stood up and never protested that, never took that on, took it for granted, and accepted the colonial benefits that existed. So, you know, we understand that, that we're at a new period of time. We're at a time when, once again, the struggle of oppressed people is winning. The US can't rule in the same old way anymore. It can't have the swagger it once had. We have Obama now with the lowest ratings everywhere, and he was just speaking in, in uh, Baltimore, and crowds of people walked out, actually, when he started speaking. He was there campaigning for somebody else. People can see it's imperialism. There's colonialism, and there's neo-colonialism, where they can get the oppressed to, to carry out the will of white power. And we live in a time when we have to, we have to take a stand. We have to say that our interest is in the interest of the entire world. We have to look at the white left, the women's movement, and say, you know, the women's movement got rights for white women at the expense of the black power movement, of the African revolution. And we see, you know, a gay movement that's saying, oh, I'm fighting to, I'm struggling to fight in Afghanistan and kill people in Afghanistan or Iraq or any place else, just like any other soldier, you know, or women, white women saying, oh, I wanna, I wanna be on the police department and gun down Africans, just like anybody else, you know? And we're saying that is opportunism. That is carrying out white rights. And that is what we, are against. We, we recognize that imperialism built on the backs of everybody else on the planet has to go. That's what everybody else is struggling for. That's the only future. This planet has destroyed humanity. It has destroyed the earth. And only the human beings who are oppressed, who are going to bring this down, are going to bring about a world in which all human beings can live. And I want to be on, on the side of history in which the people are struggling. And I, I really, you know, I just want to say that, that capitalism is a system that must go and that we can be part of the future. And I want to say, Iswileinu e Africa, that means Africa is your land. And I'm going to say, Iswileinu, and you say, e Africa. Iswelenu! Africa! Uhuru! Uhuru!